Thank you everyone for spending your Saturday afternoon with us. Today, um, on the talk of Pendatang, a conversation about you, me and other migrants, uh, Sharon Chin would be sharing one of her works that's uh, actually one of her works that's exhibited here called Pocket Seas that was uh, actually done in 2008. will also be followed by a special presentation by Katrina from uh, representing Tanaganita, and then later we'll just um, open up to a sort of more casual conversation and Q&A from um, everyone. But before we start, just some housekeeping information, um, just sort of general, like how do we set up this talk? Uh, so in February of last year, Sharon and I um, were in conversation and we sort of tried to um, uh, test out this format where if there's any sort of interjection or questions coming from the floor, you're free to sort of raise your hand or if you want to just sort of like, yeah, uh, politely get our attention and um, raise your question or a point. But because today's session is going to have uh, three very specific structure, I would encourage you to be patient and wait for Sharon's section, Katrina's section before sort of like... Um, asking your burning question um, and saving it for the Q&A session. But if you do, don't feel shy. You're encouraged to do so. Um, because also um, today we have a really sort of um, relevant uh, representative um, who's going to be discussing the subject matter that pretty much also sits within this room and this gallery um, on migrants and also refugee. There's a table at the end, just as you're walking in, and Tananganita has like books and t-shirts, CDs and um, candles that are made from the shelter. And these are not just merchandise, uh, they are also sort of the lifeline of how Tananganita sort of operates on a day-to-day -day basis. They operate on kind donations. So the CDs are going for 15 ringgit, the candles for 40. Um, the book, The Revolving Door, which was published in 2008, preceded the sort of U.S. Senate report on human trafficking in Malaysia. Um, so um, the book sort of chronicles the um, sale of um, refugees at the borders um, and it's only going for 20 ringgit. So please um, get something or, you know, um, buy something from the table. Also, if you look at the sort of tables just in front of you, um, Sharon's brought with her um, and not the, a zin from an artist who's based in Penang called Hasano. It's called Kakro, and she'll be discussing this work a little bit more later. It's for five ringgit, and the proceed goes to um, the artist. Uh, Kakro also? Oh, oh, okay, sorry. <laughs> and then the Naganita. And she's also got this really interesting sort of uh, um, publication catalog, which you can sort of cut up cut out and make it into a flip book, which mirrors sort of like um, her work here as well. Or you can sort of open it and read it like um, a brochure, a publication of sorts. So five ringgit, um, there are only 10 copies, I think, and proceeds go to Tanaganita. Um, okay, second part, questions. So you may ask, I mean, the discussions between us will be mainly in English, but if you, you're welcome to ask a question in any language that you feel comfortable, Malay, um, and if it's any other languages that we don't understand, could you please help us to sort of translate that? We're quite happy to um, accommodate, uh, but don't feel shy to ask questions just because um, English is not the first language or the language that you're comfortable asking or thinking. Um, what else? We may be able to accommodate questions written in paper if you're shy, but I hope that as the conversation happens, you would realize that you're quite nice people. <laughs> and it's going to be quite casual, so you can interject at any point. Um, if anyone's doing any live recording or live tweeting, could you just make that announcement? <laughs> early on? Um, no? Feel free to do so. I believe Ilham is also recording and they usually upload their videos on YouTube. Um, but just to, like, we just want to make it clear to everyone before the talk begins. Yeah. No? Okay. Sorry, looking at you, lady. <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, I'm just gonna. <laughs> We're all in the same room. <laughs> Uh, yeah, um, I'm just going to give a more informal introduction about these two uh, people who are here with me today because I happen to get know them quite close as well. So Sharon Chin is a visual and performance artist. Um, I like to think of her as a maker and a thinker of things that are often sort of invisible and unseen, but she does so um, and she reveals them with you know, care and a sort of delicate politics um, on difficult issues, but also quite incisive. Um, so today, um, she's going to talk about a work that was done in 2008, which is called um, Pocket Seas, <laughs> in which she spent four months in Penang at the RBS Malihom Artist Residency. Um, and she found sort of like dictionaries of um, foreign languages um, so I'm going to let her talk more about her work, but this one quote, and you will also see it at the caption um, accompanying her work over here at this exhibition, is that um, she wrote this, this phrase, of the many things brought along when moving to a foreign land, language is the one closest to us. It resides deeply in the body, spirit, and mind. When these arrive in the new land, language arrives too. So I think we'll be talking a lot about this idea of the body, the language, but also the sort of translation that happens when we move to new, when bodies move to new land. Um, this work was also uh, shown in, was also shown in Immaterial Frontiers 2.0 at the National Art Gallery in Malaysia in 2014. And it's now here as part of a group exhibition called After Work. Um, and to my right is uh, Katrina jo Joreen Malemao, um, whom I met two years ago in London. <laughs> we went to school there. Um, she's a human rights activist um, who's had like experience um, in areas of rights and dignity of um, refugees, um, migrants, and also persons in various forms of slavery, uh, modern slavery. And she advocates for and intervenes on labor rights, arrests and detention, gender-based violence, and, and intersectionality of issues and rights. So we've had many, many evenings, whenever possible, of drinks. So I hope that sort of conversations that I've had in private with these two amazing women can also be brought forth today at this, um, at this space. So feel free to join in. Um, I'm going to now pass the mic to Sharon. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Z. Hi, everybody. Um, first of all, thanks to Rahel and Chitu uh, for making this talk happen. Thanks, Chitu, for the beautiful setup. Um, and thanks, everyone, for coming. I believe there's four or five concurrent events going on, so congratulations <laughs> for making it here. Because when, like, for me, if there's so much stuff happening, my first response is just to stay home. <laughs> so thank you for being here. Okay, um, has everyone seen the show and all my work, which is behind there? Uh, if, no, okay, some people haven't. Okay, that's fine. So um, I'll describe it a bit more. Okay, so the work that's in this show is called Pocket Seas. Uh, it's an installation consisting of the frames of a mobile phone videos, mobile phone videos of the sea that I shot around Penang Island, printed on the pages of old dictionaries that I found at Charast the second-hand bookstores of, at Charasta Market in Georgetown. Um, and there are also uh, these grass mats laid out on the floor and cardboard as well. Um, so this work was in 2008. That's what? That's almost 10 years ago. So at that time, I was doing an art residency in Balik Pulau. Uh, it literally means the back of the island. Uh, if I see my pointer over here. Okay, yeah, Balik Pulau. So this is Georgetown. That's where all the happening stuff is. Um, and this is like, uh, this is, this part of the island uh, actually got some fallout from the tsunami. Uh, so, and it remains, I think, the more undeveloped part of the island, although that's changing now. Um, okay, so 
I took videos uh, from morning until evening. I started out here in Balik Pulau, where the residency is in Bukit. Uh, it's on top of a hill uh, called Bukit Penaga, and at the very top of the hill is a luxury boutique resort called Malihom. And uh, at the middle part of the hill is where they put the artists at the residency, and at the bottom of the hill is the staff that work for the hotel. So you kind of know, <laughs> you kind of know what your position is. Um, <laughs> Uh, so, uh, the first video I shot in the morning was here, and then uh, just circumnavigated the island like that. So, 12 videos in all, and printed on 12 different dictionaries. Um, this is some documentation of me shooting the videos. Uh, it's just that when I was in Penang, I realized um, I could see the sea from almost anywhere I was. So that was really the beginning or the inspiration for the work. Uh, this is the first um, installation of the work at RBS Bank in Georgetown. So, okay, I'll talk about the mats. Uh, so the family who funded my residency, the Yep family, uh, the patriarch of this family is Yap Cho Yi. And uh, I read, so they have a museum actually, and they own a lot of property all around Penang Island. Um, I read that he came over to Penang from China in the 1890s with nothing but a straw mat. And he went on to found uh, Ban Hin Li Bank and also became one of the richest people in Penang. Um, so I thought about the mat. Uh, I, to me, the mat talks about the body. Uh, it's sort of the idea of when you come over the seas with nothing, you bring your body with you, and if you roll out the mat, you sort of claim that piece of ground for the night, at least to sleep on. So that becomes your home in a way. Um, and another thing that you bring over the seas along with your body is also language. So that's something, you can be stripped of everything and not even have paper, but these things you will still have, your body and the language that resides in your body. So, um, uh, I don't know, but I don't know if you know, but at Charasta Market, uh, the second-hand bookstores are really well known. So that's where I found uh, the various dictionaries, different languages. Um, And I guess I was thinking that uh, each language is also a kind of ocean. Um, so this, the, the metaphors in this work kind of, um, one, one thing informs the other, but it's also about mobility. The main idea is mobility because um, bodies cross the sea, languages come along with the bodies and wash up on our shores. Uh, Languages are as vast as an ocean, but they also, in dictionary form, fit in your pocket, and mobile phones fit in your pocket. Um, so I thought of languages as having a sea in your pocket, and that's why the work is called Pocket Seas. Okay, so that's enough about me. <laughs> um, I'm gonna talk uh, about five different artworks from Malaysian artists who have also uh, dealt with the subject of migrant workers or migration. Um, and the first of these is actually, uh, you can find them on the tables in front and also at the back, Kakral Zin. It's by Hassanul Ishraf Idris, uh, who is part of a artist collective and gallery in Penang called Run Amok. Um, and uh, uh, he made this zine in 2015. So if you, don't, if you haven't seen copies of the zine, this, these are some pages of it. Okay. So um, in 2015, uh, he made that zine as part of this project called, uh, a part of a project called Gerai Chowdhury, um, where uh, Run and Bok collaborated together to build a kind of makeshift uh, stall that sold uh, snacks, cigarettes, and sort of various sundry goods 
uh, that you could get around the area of Hin Bus Depot, Hin Bus Art Depot, where Run Amok Gallery is. So around that area, there's a large Bangladeshi community. Um, and uh, a worker from Bangladesh at Hin Bus uh, took Hassanul around the area uh, just to research and sort of like have a tour. And uh, Hassanul came across this strange vegetable called a kakrol or called kakrol. It's a kind of gourd that uh, comes from Bangladesh and it grows in cold climates. So he found this um, extremely exotic uh, for, 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 for to come across it in Penang. So uh, also he came across uh, these things called systematic word books. So they're kind of like dictionaries that are handed out to um, uh, uh, workers from Bangladesh when they come over as a kind of orientation, you know, get to know the language. Um, and there's like little doodles in it and stuff. So uh, he decided to make the zine um, over here uh, featuring a kakrol character. So it's kind of like a phrase book, kind of like comics. Um, it's a bit satirical. I, I found it incredibly moving um, when I saw it. And another thing about this work that I loved is the fact that um, of its distributability, and that's why zines are so great, um, because even though he's making this work about uh, Bang Bangladeshi workers, uh, he, it's actually possible to give the zine back to the people from whom he was inspired. So it, he, he didn't take the material from a subject and put it in, let's say, a gallery where they have no access to it. Um, so that's why I think this work is pretty great. And that's also something that I'm always concerned with when you make work about uh, the other. How does the other get to see it? You know, what's the form of return? Okay. Okay, uh, the next artist I'm going to talk about is Okui Lala. She's a young artist, also based in Penang, um, and she made this uh, sorry, video, uh, As If Home. Uh, in collaboration, is it in collaboration? Okay, she paid uh, a, a very skilled um, Bangladeshi construction worker to teach her how to build a model house. Um, and then she made a video about it. So I'm going to show you about a minute of this video. Baru sampai tak tahu lah. Tapi nasib baik itu jam ada kawan satu uh, dia ajar saya uh, dia belajar dia cakap ini semen panggil semen itu apa apa nama dia lagi itu hari itu jam saya masuk kerja sama Cina dia orang bahasa cakap Melayu mah jarang cara cakap Bangla saya tujuh bulan kerja sana dia orang selalu cakap Melayu kan kalau tak paham dia tanya ini nah saya sudah paham apa ini nama ini Eh, itu batang ka, itu semen ka, itu kada tak tahu lah, mari, ini macam lah, pertama saya tak tahu lah, hmm. uh, susah sikit, lepas uh, tiga empat bulan ini macam, sikit sikit tahu, sudah tujuh bulan, uh, boleh pandai sikit lah, lepas kerja sama Bangladesh, kita kawan, lagi ada Cina, Cina orang, uh, baru saya pandai sikit lah, uh, ini macam belajar, belajar. Okay, um, so Okui actually expressed some um, discomfort about how she related to Mustafa in this work. Um, and I quote her, uh, Mustafa still views me as an employer, a weird employer that, play, that pays him to build a house and she wants to build it together. It was no problem to get the answer that I wanted. So um, after this work, she made another work called uh, Let's Drink and Eat Tea, where she felt she developed her approach. Um, she worked with 
uh, Stephen Nini from Myanmar, who's been living in Penang for 20 years. And uh, they, they, together with uh, uh, Florence Lei from Myanmar, decided to make a cooking video about how to make Burmese tea salad. And I'll show you some of that video now. Historically, La Pet was a peace offering between kingdoms after war. Okay, um, yeah, I can't show you too much because I just want to respect everyone's time. So about this work, she said, I feel more comfortable working with differences. Differences, borders, awkwardness is okay, and we actually need to be able to talk about it. I think working on migrations, identities, in collaborative work is challenging, as the you and me gap is even more visible. My current approach is to show or work with the awkwardness. So um, what I like about this is that the artist herself is working through the process and the pitfalls uh, of making work with and about the other. All right. Um, the next artist I'm going to talk about, uh, Minstrel Quick. Um, this is just a series. OK, Minstrel is uh, an artist. Uh, she works with photography, um, also mixed media. She's a wonderful artist. And, um, uh, but in particular, her photography, I think her kind of looking is, uh, it just reveals like a very sensitive eye. So she lives in Kajang. And uh, this is a suite of photographs that I'm going to play for you. There's quite a lot of them. I'll scroll through them quickly. Uh, and I just would like everyone just to like, look very carefully. So this is like a suite of photographs uh, called A Few Pictures from Kajang, 2014 to 2016. Okay, so um, I guess I just like the tenderness in those photographs. And uh, if you know the uh, photographer Ismail Hashim, I think uh, there are some similarities in the way, in the, just in the form of the looking, the slowness of the looking, which I think is quite um, difficult today. 
uh, and what that looking can tell us. Um, also, it's I feel these photographs uh, are a migrant looking at her home. So uh, that is Kajang, yeah, that it's being constructed by other migrants. Um, yeah. Okay, next. Um, KG Krishnan's home. So uh, this project is actually in two parts. One of them uh, is a series of photographs that he took of migrant workers' living spaces on construction sites. And uh, the other part of the project is a zine project in collaboration with Beatrice Long, Leong, where they gave uh, construction workers disposable cameras and asked them to take pictures of their daily life. And they published it uh, in this zine. Fortunately, I don't have the zine here. Um, and they also uh, chose to publish these photographs as a zine uh, in print and not online to preserve the privacy of the construction workers. Um, this is uh, KG's suite of photographs. Okay, so um, what I found interesting about this work is when we compare um, how KG looks, uh, you know, his form of seeing in these photographs compared to um, the construction workers' form of seeing when they take photographs of their own lives, they represent themselves. And also the difference between KG's looking and uh, minstrel's photographs as well. Uh, what they can reveal to us about, you know, the different ways that we see the other, the different ways that we relate to um, migrants. Okay, uh, the last artist I'm going to talk about is Ao Sao Yi and her work from 2015, Pak Thai Photo. Uh, this is a two-channel video installation. Uh, here, here's a photo of the setup, and I'll play you a little bit of the video. Um, so, Pak Thai Photo is a very old photo studio around Jalan Sultan, and uh, in fact, it dates back to pre-Merdeka days. Uh, and uh, around that area, there are, there are a lot of uh, workers from all over, so from Bangladesh, from Myanmar, also from China. And what Sao Yi did was interview these workers and overlay their narrative. What she asked them was uh, uh, where they came from, uh, how and why they left and came to Malaysia, uh, and also uh, where they, what's an ideal place that they would like to go to, uh, and also to sing uh, a childhood song. So she overlaid these narratives, these stories, uh, over footage of the interior of Pak Thai Photo. Okay, I'll show you the video now. Sekarang mau buat rumah pun punya, tapi kita tak campur dia punya pulau. Pada kau ni ada si kiu, ada orang jauh di mana, ada orang di kiri. 但是人家也好啦我又我有一個小女兒我老豆又開廠不過我母老家的錢是七百幾萬我老媽子都給了六百幾萬我還給人家一萬自己百幾萬做做商場的是不是十二十幾歲我就做生意做失敗了都錢在
誒耕田啊，俾人唱嘅，因為我嗰啲歌，我咪我係隨城市出世啊，因為嗰條歌係唔係咁啱啊。Beja masamini so kita sana ada masalah kita punya politika macam gawaman saya memang tak betul ni, memang tak betul gawaman saya dia mau hidup sendiri bukan dia mau pikir kita. So kita bila masa kita sudah jadi apa jadi besar umur kita sudah lebih kan kita sudah boleh buat. Okay, um, I'll stop it there. So about this work. Uh, also a very slow work that you need to really sit down and engage with over time. Um, what I loved about it is uh, when, I, when I saw this show, the notes that I wrote about it was that it folded in narratives uh, as gently as one might fold ingredients to bake a cake. So this idea of, uh, I think it, um, because for me, Paktai Photo, so it represents uh, our obsession with nostalgia. Uh, you know, we love old things in Malaysia. You sort of want to get back to a uh, golden past where you know it was all lovely. Uh, but this work kind of disrupts that um, and uh, includes other voices as part of our story. Uh, so the, I, I think um, the problem is that if we insist that there's only one story of Malaysia, then everything else necessarily lives outside of that. Everything else that is not that story, we always keep as the other. I mean, we might, we might treat it uh, as, oh, we need to help them, uh, or we need, to, uh, you know, we need to do better by them, but they are never part of us. You know? We never see them as part of uh, our story. Um, so, um, this action of folding in narratives creates space, uh, not just for them, but also for us, like for our future, you know, to imagine our future so we don't get locked into this one idea of what Malaysia is. Um, and I think that's something that art also can do. That's one of the things that art can do that very few other things can do. So, okay, thank you, I'm done. Thanks. Just sort of like to, I don't know, summarize, just so that we can move on to um, Katrina before we transition to that, is that in these sort of works that are um, taking the idea of migration or migrants um, as the subject matters in, in this art, um, there is this uh, theme of the language, um, the idea of that translation Right. Um, there's also a distance as well, both between um, me and the other, but also the artist and the subject. And then also, then how do you look at the object and the audience? Um, but what I find um, is sort of recurring is that in the looking at this distance and the language, there is always a sense of um, trying to locate home. Um, and it seems like home is the, the hardest part, or maybe most elusive, I don't know. So m one of the things that, one of the questions that is staying with me right now um, is that, is it a looking at home in, in this work, and also maybe to answer the larger question of this exhibition, or is it a looking away from, from home? Um, and on that note, maybe the looking away from home, I would like to, um, get Katrina to talk about um, some of the stories of um, um, the people that she's worked with, right? Thank you so much to Z and Sharon and to Ilham um, for inviting us. Uh, my name is Katrina, I'm from Tanaganita, um, and I would like to just share a bit about what Tanaganita's work is. 
um, and also the stories of, of migrants and refugees that we've met through the course of our work. So just a very quick snapshot on um, what Tanaganita is. Tanaganita is a Malaysian human rights organization. We started in 1991 uh, working with women in the plantation sector, Malaysian women in the, in the factories, and, um, but we started to, through our course of our work, um, have more and more migrants show up at the office looking for places where they needed help. Um, and at that time, in the early 90s, as you can imagine, Malaysia is going through this huge development boom. Um, we were having lots of migrant workers come into Malaysia, but very, very few spaces where migrants could actually go and, um, and access help, which they desperately needed. And so it's always been Tanaganita's, um, as part of our ethos, to respond to um, the needs, to respond to communities that are often uh, at the most marginalized um, in, in society. And, um, and so that's when we started to get involved with migrants and refugees. Um, overall, the work is um, we do we take on cases. That cases really are the heartbeat of um, of the organisation. So it's mainly unpaid wages, um, labour rights violations, people in various forms of trafficking or modern day slavery, arrest and detention, um, and sexual and gender based violence of refugees and migrants. Um, the cases and and through the cases, the stories inform the advocacy that we do, both in Malaysia um, and internationally. And so advocacy in the sense of wanting to change the, the legal framework, the climate that we uh, operate under, but also changing people's attitudes, um, understanding that laws um, are not um, distilled away from our culture and our belief systems. And so the advocacy is to change that also. Um, to do awareness raising, to talk about the stories that we often don't want to talk about, to make known the hurts that we see um, the human rights violations that are experienced. Um, we do a lot of training and education work, not just um, among migrant and refugee communities, but also among other activists, um, with young lawyers, um, and anybody really who's interested in, in coming together to build this network of support for migrants and refugees. Um, we work closely with refugee and migrant organizations. Um, TANMA is one of the organizations that we work um, very closely with and they're a refugee fair trade women's um, cooperative in Malaysia um, and we, we try and see how we can support them through our um, using our organization as a legal basis or through administrative support um, and really number seven is whatever else we need to do because I think our it's important when you do human rights work to understand that um, the vision, the goal that you want is to, is to address these, these wrongs, but also to build a, a different world. And so we cannot allow ourselves to become rigid in, in just following structured programs, but rather responding and moving where we need to move. So that's just kind of a very quick snapshot of, uh, of Tanaganita. Um, just so that everybody has, we're on a similar page on uh, migrants and refugees in Malaysia, a very, very, very brief overview. So when we speak about migrants and refugees, we're talking about uh, migrants, migrant workers who've come to Malaysia, but also refugees. And often we think about migrants as those who have just come for uh, economic benefit. Um, and that is true. But I also want us to interrogate this idea about people, um, the, the choice to leave, when we know increasingly in, in um, the way in which the global economy is, a lot of migrants come to Malaysia to work because um, the, they don't have the opportunities back home, and sometimes that's purposeful. So countries rely very much on sending their citizens abroad um, in order to get remittances back. And so the, we know migrants come here, but there's also the element of how much choice do they have, really, um, when they are going out to seek work for survival. Um, and then there are refugees. Refugees, as you know, are people who are fleeing for their lives. They are suffering from various forms of persecution, and uh, they need to leave. And so they come to Malaysia, and they, they go all over the world, really, trying to seek a safe place. So right now in Malaysia, there are between four to six million uh, migrants um, estimated. It's very hard to get an exact number because we see that um, over, over the last decade at least, 50% of migrants tend to be undocumented. 
Um, it's a huge number, but we also know that the majority, something like 80%, come into Malaysia with the with legal documents, they come in following what they understand to be the process, uh, but they end up becoming undocumented in Malaysia. And um, it's there's a lot to talk about within that. Um, um, the the kinds of, of, of legal framework um, that we have in Malaysia that makes people undocumented, um, which is a bit too much to go into, but I'm happy to discuss that later. Primarily migrants in Malaysia are from 12 main countries, um, the b big ones would be Indonesia, Bangladesh, Cambodia, Vietnam, the Philippines, Nepal, India, um, and so forth. 40% of migrants um, are women, um, and I think that's something that I like to explicitly say because they don't often come into our imagination immediately when we talk about migrant workers, um, but women are a substantial part of the workforce. Um, when it comes to refugees, um, there are over 150,000 refugees registered with UNHCR, um, maybe 50,000 more who are unregistered, 100,000, it, it's very hard to, to tell really. Um, the biggest population is obviously from Burma or Myanmar, and then the Sri Lankans, Pakistanis, Iraqis, Syrians, Somalians, Palestinian refugees. Um, over 30% are women, and um, over 35,000 are children. Um, I don't want to talk too much about the law, um, but I, I do think there are a couple of things that we, we have to understand. Um, firstly, when it comes to refugees, um, Malaysia doesn't recognize the status of a refugee legally. So nowhere in our legislation um, do refugees appear. What we have, though, um, is this arrangement with the United Nations High Commission for Refugees that allows them to be um, registered with the UNHCR but it's sort of an informal understanding. It's a memorandum of understanding with the government, um, which means that it's, it's not secure, right? Um, and it also means that the state, the Malaysian government, doesn't do anything to make sure that refugee rights are protected. Um, and so under the Malaysian law, we have the Immigration Act, which is a very, very, very powerful act. And it defines so much of the refugee and migrant experience. Um, refugees are seen to be undocumented. I mean, no, not even undocumented, they're seen to be illegal. And that's a word that maybe we can talk about a bit more later. So that's one thing that you should know about refugees in Malaysia. Um, not seen as refugees, seen as undocumented persons. The second thing um, is that the, when it comes to one subsect of, of migrant workers in Malaysia, that's domestic workers, or as many of you might know them as maids. Um, domestic workers are a huge part of the Malaysian workforce, um, but their work is also not recognized as work under the Employment Act. Um, they are seen as, defined as servants. And this idea of servitude um, also shapes very much the experience of domestic workers um, and also how we as Malaysians see them. And that's something I'll, I'll share a bit more about later. Um, the third thing that you should know is that we do have an Anti-Trafficking in Persons Act. It was passed in 2007 after lots and lots of um, advocacy. Um, but while the act exists, there's still very little space for survivors of trafficking, survivors of slavery to get justice. So kind of the best case scenario is your trafficker will be arrested and put into prison and found guilty. But you get nothing. <laughs> you, you get to... Um, be free and, and go home. Um, but the wages that you've been, um, that they're due, um, it, there's no, nothing, no provision in it for, for you to claim that back. So the concept of justice and where the survivor exists in the law is really missing. And finally, as I said, um, you really must understand how powerful the Immigration Act is in Malaysia and how powerful the, um, the Minister of um, Home Affairs is. So even though migrant workers, is, it has to do with work, it has to do with labor, um, it doesn't come under the um, um, Ministry of Labor. It comes under, our understanding is national security, despite them being part of the, the workforce. So it's a bit of a dry snapshot, but um, I think some elements that, that we need to understand uh, when it comes to um, talking about refugees and migrants in Malaysia. Um, Tanaganita, in the last two years, we've taken up um, over, over 250 cases uh, involving something like over 2,000 um, um, claimants. And the majority of cases have to do with unpaid wages, um, have to do with people being forced to work in conditions without a contract, 
Um, there are numerous cases of domestic workers. Um, within domestic workers, you know, sexual violence, food deprivation, physical violence, being controlled because their passports are held. Um, these are just some of these snapshots of, of the violations. And I, I say all of this, and I'm always very uncomfortable naming um, these terms because I, I, I don't know if they convey really the severity of, um, of what these experiences are. But maybe that's something that we can, we can discuss as we go on. So when I was thinking about the, um, what to share today, there's, there's so much. Um, but I, I thought I'd bring it down to three stories that I, I really want to, um, to share with you. Um, and these are people that I have personally met through the work at Tanaganita. And I think that they are stories that we, we need to tell, um, but that we often don't. So this is Noor. Noor is a domestic worker from Indonesia. She came here, like many, many, many domestic workers, to work in a Malaysian home. Um, she worked for five years in a home somewhere in the Klang Valley. For five years, she was never once allowed to leave her, the home of her employer. For five years, she never received her wages. She was kept in this, uh, she was allowed to sleep in what seemed to be like a storeroom. She was never once allowed to contact her family, never once allowed to leave. She talked to us about how she wasn't allowed to pray. The food that she would be given to eat was often just the leftover scraps when the employers had finished their meal. Um, and after five years of enduring this, after five years of, I think, holding on to some sort of hope that she will be paid, that things will change, um, she couldn't take it anymore. And she said, um, it, came, it came one night when she held an, a knife essentially to her throat and um, threatened to kill herself if she didn't get her wages. And so the employer then said, okay, we will we'll give you what your, your wages are and, and we'll send you back to Indonesia. The next day with the agent, um, they put her in a car with some of her belongings and they drove her to this place that looked like a beachside. Um, they gave her some money and they said, there'll be a boat over there swim towards the boat, and the boat will take you back to Indonesia. And we do know that there are these informal processes of these boats that leave from Malaysia to Indonesia. Um, but for Noor, this is her experience, right? She doesn't know where she is. All she knows is she has a plastic bag of her things, um, some money, definitely not five years worth of wages, um, and a boat in the middle of the sea and asking her to swim. Um, she didn't know how to swim, but in this point, she's got her, essentially her trafficker behind her, uh, and what is possibly hope to head home. So she starts to try and to swim. She doesn't know how to. It's dark and the waves are just crashing and the next thing you know she is being roused. Um, she was basically knocked back in the waters. Um, there were some other, we don't know if they're migrants or Malaysians who found her and they thought that she had died and they had covered her with banana leaves. Um, when she came to it, she somehow made her way to the street um, some good Samaritan picked her up and she found her way to, to Naganita and she was in our shelter. So that's when we, we met Noor and we, through trying to trace down where she worked for um, I think more than a year she stayed at the shelter um, and the, trying to get back her wages and trying to get back some justice for her. Uh, eventually that didn't work, the legal processes didn't work. We raised funds and um, we sent her back home. Um, the picture that you see here is, is taken by Rahman Roslan, a photographer, and he followed Noor back in her journey from Malaysia back to her home in Indonesia. In this, in this moment right here that's captured is Noor telling her family for the first time what had happened um, in Malaysia. So when, when Noor came to our shelter, it meant five years had passed, right, since she had left home. Five years of never having contact with her family. And in that five years, her family essentially had thought that she had died um, because they hadn't heard from, this, from the wife, from the mother, uh, from the sister. And, um, and so these, they, they thought she had died. Her daughter had gotten married and she had become a grandmother, which she obviously didn't know about. Her husband had remarried. And you can't blame him because he had lost his wife for five years who'd gone missing. 
and and all these things that happened to her um, during that time, and and this is her coming back to this home and trying to make sense of this of this life that had changed so fundamentally. Um, and really, all that she did was come to Malaysia to try and, and work so that her kids would be able to go to school. Um, her home was also um, part of it was destroyed in the tsunami. I mean, there was just so many aspects of her life that had been completely shattered. And so when we talk about domestic workers, um, and when I say to you that the majority of domestic workers in Malaysia are in states of bonded labor, well, because they are seen as servants, because the majority of domestic workers don't have any day off, because the majority of them, their passports are held by employers. Um, all of that sounds so sanitized, but really, this is what it means. It's ex it's not a, it's exceptional because this is her story, and it absolutely matters. But it's not exceptional in that it's so uncommon. Um, we've met hundreds and hundreds of domestic workers who have gone through various states of being trapped in Malaysian homes. Um, and on the flip side, we've also met so many Malaysians who are so angry with us for talking about this um, because they we've gone to a stage where we think it's kind of normal to have um, foreign women in our homes um, doing the work that needs to be done in order for us to keep surviving as families and as communities. Um, but this is, this is what it means um, on the end of, of the migrant and the person. The second story I want to tell you about is Zotun. Zotun is a Burmese refugee who um, came to Malaysia fleeing persecution and violence in Myanmar. And like the over 100,000 refugees in Malaysia, um, Zotun is undocumented, um, despite having his um, UNHCR documents. So when he was in Malaysia, he was arrested during one of the immigration raids. He was put into an immigration detention center. And, um, and at that time, um, so you, know, you can't send refugees back to um, where they've come from or where they'll, they'll be um, uh, harmed. And there's an international principle called non reformo Basically, if you, if you, you're, you're, you'll be in violation of that if you were to deport a refugee back home. And so in 2007, 2008, 2009, we were finding that the, what the Malaysian government um, was doing or what people within the Malaysian government were doing was that refugees would, would be arrested put into immigration detention centers, and, um, and there were people from the detention centers who would then drive the refugees to the Malaysia-Thailand border, where they would be sold to traffickers for about 500 ringgit, 700 ringgit per head. Um, the refugees then, in this no man's land between Malaysia and Thailand, would be given a week to um, deposit between 2,500 ringgit to 4,000 ringgit into the traffickers' bank account. And they would then, um, if they are successfully successful in doing that, then they'd be sent back into Malaysia. So you buy your freedom back into Malaysia. Um, if you couldn't, then you would be sold to work in, in brothels, to work in plantations, or in Zotun's case, um, to work as a, um, a slave on a fishing trawler. So for three years, he was on a boat in the middle of the ocean. For three years, he never once came to shore. Um, so he was essentially, it was him and about 10 other, other slaves on this fishing boat. Um, they would have to work. They would sleep maybe three hours a day. Um, if they protest, protested, um, you'd be threatened. You'd be you know, thrown overboard. Um, and they'd do their catch. And another boat would come and pick up the fish. And so there was, they would remain in, in the middle of the sea. And so he was there for three years. And he only managed to escape uh, when the boat um, needed to be repaired and couldn't be repaired uh, while still at sea and needed to be docked. And that's when he and a few others decided that they needed to make a break for it. And if they were killed, they'd be killed, but um, they needed to do that to get to safety. And so when, when we met him, um, he, had, he had escaped, and we met him through others uh, in the refugee community who told us the story. And his story, unfortunately, is, is not that uncommon. It was, it was amazing that we got to meet him because many, many, many others, um, slaves at sea, um, 
we don't know what happens to them, right? You, you perish at sea. It's consistent with the stories that we've seen in Sarawak, for example, of bodies just washing up shore. Um, his story about how you are remaining on this boat and you eat basically scraps of small fish and maybe a handful of rice, um, where slaves who fall sick would then be thrown overboard, uh, are so consistent with the stories of, of Vietnamese refugees, Cambo Vietnamese um, fishermen, Cambodian fishermen, Thai fishermen who've been trafficked onto the seas um, um, in Malaysia and, and in the region. Um, when we, we documented his story and some of the others in our book called The Global Catch, and just a short excerpt that I like to read from it. Three years they remained at sea, never stepping on land. The memories come back and he closes his eyes for a moment and then says ever so softly, it was hell. What becomes of a man who toils and toils but reaps no benefit? Who can speak but is never spoken to? Who eats only from the scraps of others? Who knows not time or day, month or year? Who cannot rest when weary or close his eyes to seek relief, who has a family and loved ones, but doesn't know if they are alive or dead. What becomes of a person who is stripped from all choice, freedom and dignity? What are they left with? The third story that I want to tell you about is the story of Susu. Susu is also a refugee, a refugee from Burma, who um, was in Malaysia. And one day her and her husband were picked up by immigration. They were arrested and they were put into detention. Um, at the time of her arrest, she didn't realize that she was pregnant. She was pregnant with her first child. Um, she was about two months pregnant then. We came to hear about Susu and others um, it, from detention had told us about this pregnant woman who um, was in, she was heavily pregnant. Um, she looked like she was in really poor health and um, she hadn't received any medical attention. So I don't know how many of you know, but Malaysia has these immigration detention centers. They're not prisons, they are detention centers for people who've um, violated the immigration law. So maybe they don't have proper work permits, maybe they're working for an employer that is not the employer and their work permit, maybe their passport had expired, uh, or maybe they're refugees, right, who don't have these documents. So when we heard about Susu's case, um, we heard that she was in, in physical distress, as you can imagine, a pregnant woman in detention. Um, and so I went to the detention center with a nurse and trying desperately to see if we could just see her and provide some kind of support for her, um, either medicines or food or anything. We don't know. We just wanted to be able to see her. So when I went to the detention center, we, um, we, we told the officer we were here to visit this person. This was her name. And can we see her? And um, she said, absolutely not. Uh, and I said, look, we, we hear that she's really not well. Uh, and we know that she's pregnant. And we have a nurse here. It's really no cost to you. We will do everything. We just want to check in on her. Um, and they said, uh, no. And, and in fact, this is what the officer told me. Um, oh, yeah, I've seen her. I see her walking about. She's all right. Because that's the kind of bar that we set for um, how a pregnant woman is, is um, doing well in Malaysia. If you're a migrant, you know, if you're walking about, then that's, that's fine. Um, so it, it took a long time, and, uh, and finally, with a lot of advocacy through UNHCR, through the Immigration Department, um, we finally got her released. But she, was, um, she had a child when she was in the detention center. And I want to read a bit of an, an excerpt from an interview she did with a journalist called Karen Zussman. Susu tells us she was given no special treatment during her pregnancy. She had to sleep on the wooden floor in Lenging Camp, where bugs crawled up between the cracks. Everyone had bed bugs and couldn't stop scratching. When they slept, they were so close they touched each other's bodies. When her body became very swollen all over, she asked to see the doctor but was refused. Finally, doubled up in pain, she went into labor. And only when other detainees screamed continuously for help for her was Susu transferred to a local hospital where she had her baby. 
Right after she gave birth, the very next day, Susu and her baby were sent back to the immigration detention center. Within a day, the baby turned yellow and needed to be taken back to the hospital. This young mother, who herself had just given birth, remained in the detention center. It took a few months before she was released and before she and her baby were released. And this is a picture of her and the baby in our office, and she's telling me what had happened. The marks on her body from the bed bugs are consistent with what we hear from other detainees. We know that detainees um, are given very, very poor food. They're given maybe a, one mug of water. Um, detention camps are often crowded. There's very poor sanitation. If you're sick, at best, you'll get a Panadol. When she and her baby were sent back um, to the detention after she gave birth, the only special provision she was given was a bowl and a washcloth. Um, and, um, and that was it. Uh, and maybe hot water um, if she needed to clean the baby. Um, Susu's husband, who was also a refugee, was um, whipped. Whipping is one of the uh, penalty penalties you can face in Malaysia if you're an undocumented migrant. And the kind of whipping that happens is uh, it amounts to torture under international law. And he described to me the, the whipping and he showed me the scars on his back where the flesh had split from the stroke of the, um, the cane. Um, and they are refugees and, and, and this, is what, um, this is how we treat them in Malaysia. I also this idea of that every time I think about Susun, I think about pregnancy and I think about motherhood and I think about how we, as a society, we celebrate that, right? We have baby showers and we have, you know, everything that's horribly pink and blue and as gendered as you can make it. Um, you have um, balloons and cake and it's, it's joyous. It was all kinds of rituals that we go through because pregnancy is a thing to be celebrated un unless it's pregnancy of a, a refugee or a migrant. And there's something about the migrant body that we think of differently. And there's something about the migrant womb that we pathologize. Um, migrant domestic, um, not domestic, migrant women in Malaysia aren't allowed to become pregnant. Um, their pregnancy is seen as a disease under our, um, uh, under our current laws. So you know, migrant workers have to go through these health screenings, right? And only if you pass it, then you can be a, a worker in Malaysia. A pregnancy is classified as a disease under those screenings. And I think that says something about us as a people. Um, when, we, when we look at the, at the migrant woman and, and, we, and we treat her, her womb and her reproductive rights in this particular manner. I think the other thing that I want to say, and I know I'm running out of time, but um, I want to put out there is that when we think about, about migrants and we think about refugees, we think of them as their status. Um, their status as a refugee, we think of them as, as the laborer, as the plantation worker. But they are people with desires and with needs and multiple identities. Um, but somehow we can't seem to see that. Um, we can't seem to see the multitudes that they contain beyond the function that we want to extract from them. Um, we use this word illegal so casually. Um, but what does that mean for somebody to be illegal? Are we saying that they are not worthy of existence? Um, what does that illegality do to all their various parts of their identities? What does that strip them into? Um, and I, th I, I would really like us for, to reflect on that word a bit more. I think in the work that we see, it's that once you start to you strip somebody of their identity, you call them illegal, then you start to strip them of their rights. You say that there's, they are here as functions, um, we are here as these bodies within which contains labor that we can take. Or they are here as bodies, as refugees that we will tolerate, um, but we don't really accept. And so, it is f difficult for us to accept that maybe refugees and migrants want pleasure, they want leisure, they want relationships, they want to make choices for themselves, they want to make choices on how their time is spent, um, they want to do, they want to marry, which they can't in Malaysia, they want to have children, which they can't in Malaysia. And when you start to take away, when you start to peel away all these different rights that you and I take for granted, 
then you create the space where it starts to become okay to fill that with violence. Because after a while, you stop seeing them as people. They, they become something else. And I think that's something that I would like us to think about. Um, think about the climate that we have created in Malaysia that has made this okay. Just checking on time. So we can we can talk about things later. I want to give the space for us to have a conversation also. I would like to begin from this sort of weightiness, the gravity of um, the stories and also the accounts that you've shared. Um, isn't it ironic that we're all seated here um, in a space that discusses or even um, visualizes the sort of bodies that are being spoken about um, and of bodies who can speak, like you said, to, to borrow your quote, but it's not spoken to. Um, so I want to start this conversation maybe with this sort of like the, the stark difference between Sharon, your earlier presentation of the works, and also artists who investigate or explore this as a, a, a thematic um, exploration in their works. And Katrina, you're sort of um, very grounded and also very realistic accounts of the people um, with whom you've worked with. Um, and also the context at which we are situated at today, which is an artist talk. So the question is very simple, Sharon. Why did you invite Katrina? I, I have to think through this answer because that is also a question in my mind and I felt that I would only know the answer by doing it. Uh, I think I can start from the intuitive question or dissatisfaction, I suppose, with uh, this show, or shows that are like this, or art that is uh, about a, a, a subject, a, a, a subject, uh, an issue, I guess. Um, how to square it, not so much square, it, sorry, because you can't square it, it's not a balance sheet. Uh, it's, it's uh, what does it mean? Yeah, I think that's really <laughs> what the question that's in my mind, what does it mean uh, to do this work, artwork, uh, and because it is work, um, and when we set it alongside migrant uh, labor, which is also a form of work, and human rights work, which Katrina does, also work. So that's one of the patterns that I think about, the forms of work. Um, I think I... I think I needed to introduce a sense of stakes for myself. I wanted to put myself there. So, and I'm sorry, but I put everyone else there as well. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. I mean, good. I, 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 I was curious about, about that, um, and I decided not to ask you before. Just so to, to sort of get the conversation along, because um, uh, we've discussed a lot of sort of like themes and we see them sort of like, you know, being um, depicted in, in works and there is, you can't help it, but there is always that sense of that distance um, when 
these bodies or their their statuses are removed from their identity and that brings me back to your sort of last few slides about the status right um how um when you said that that phrase uh, migrants uh, womb is pathologized it really struck a chord like it's it's it kind of cuts you that that phrase because i wonder whether or not um, in the same way of uh, labor transaction, people um, accord labels or descriptions to strip off the identities of these bodies, of these migrants, of these, these humans who are in foreign lands. Um, does, art, is, is art, does art share some sort of culpability in, in doing that too, stripping that sort of identity and putting them on white walls? Um, not maybe, yeah. <laughs> Sorry to interrogate you like this, but um. yes, yes, it does. It does. It does. It does. <laughs> uh, which is why I am constantly. Uh, uh, sorry, this is not a um, incriminatory stance. Uh, it really is a place of questioning because these are questions I ask myself, uh, which is why I'm obsessed with the the, the notion of return. Um, when we make art about something, it comes from somewhere. Uh, make art about someone, that person, uh, we are coming from somewhere, and just as the other person is always coming from somewhere, so we are all coming from somewhere, uh, and it has to go back somewhere. We are always returning. So you, com you complete a circle. There is a, there is a circle. Uh, and that's why I was uh, so taken with Hassanul's zine, Kakral zine. Because, uh, and it's not, uh, it, the, the circle can be extremely wide. So it can, something that you took something from can go through many, many, uh, can, go, can describe an extremely large circle before it comes back, hopefully, uh, in some way, to where you took it from. And uh, Hassanul Zin comes back, and uh, it makes itself available to be able to come back. Uh, and the process of that circle um, is also, in some ways, why I, 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 I'm so glad that Katrina uh, is able to be here today because uh, you can, it doesn't have to be direct, you know, you take something from someone and then you pass it back to that person, no. Uh, you, you, but you, you, it needs to return in some way. Yeah. So I think that, that two things that I want to respond to immediately to that, and firstly, it's, it's the role of art, right? Um, now, the work that we do, I, and one of the challenges of human rights work generally, is that it tends to remain in these spaces um, that are quite exclusive. So human rights work will exist within maybe courtrooms, or um, conference halls, um, or the UN, um, in, in sort of these platforms that are quite detached from everyday lives. But really, human rights is, um, it's, it's the most lived thing that you can think about because it exists in all of us. I mean, it's, its very nature is that it resides in, in all bodies, across all boundaries. Um, so it is a problem when human rights work then becomes um, something that is detached from everybody who isn't either an advocate or um, su somebody who's suffering rights violations and trying to claim justice. And so there's that space that I think we need to keep creating that takes these very, very real hurts, like these stories that I told you about. Like I can list off all these statistics on, um, on cases, but the statistics are people. Um, they, they, are, they are entire lives and they are spirals of violence because they have families and they have communities. Um, they have their own bodies which have gone through these pains. And we have to find ways to make this known because I think there is a there is an intimacy to violence that all of us have 
but we have somehow created these barriers in our minds um, that prevents us from touching it. Who among us here has a domestic worker at home? I, I, I was raised by a domestic worker, yeah. Who among us here knows one person who has a domestic worker at home? Who among us here has, lives in a neighborhood with domestic workers? I mean, it's, it's, it's almost literally everyone. There are generations, right, of us who were raised by domestic workers. And there is, that, when I say there's an intimacy to that violence, how do we get to be a people that we are all, you know, fairly nice, kind people, educated, um, civilized by every definition of what that word is, um, but at the same time live alongside this violence? There is some kind of a disconnect in our minds that enables us to get comfortable with what is servitude um, within our homes. And our homes are the most intimate and personal of our spheres um, that we can exist in. And so I, I say that because I think that one of our, the most important roles of art um, and anyone who does this work is to make things really, really uncomfortable for all of us so that we start to see and we start to challenge um, these arguments that we've made for ourselves um, in order to justify the kinds of practices that um, are, are real and true all around us. And so when, you know, we, Sharon and I were speaking earlier about the, the use of the word trafficking even, and my own discomfort with that, because I think it's such a, a legal term, and the term hides what is essentially slavery. If I ask you all to think about slavery, I think most of you think about shackles, you think about these slave ships, you're thinking about the transatlantic slave trade. Um, and they're often like these grainy black and white pictures. And the slave masters in those pictures don't look anything like us. Um, because they're also narratives from the, from the, from the West. Um, and, and yes, that was a horrific thing, the, the transatlantic slave trade. Um, but we need to find ways to update that definition to the realities today. Um, it's, it's in our homes, it's in the, the, this country is built on the backs of migrant workers. And often it's migrant workers who are in some state of, of slavery. Um, it's something that's really disturbing that we can, how many you know, migrants die in construction sites and it's like news for a day and then no, nothing happens after that. And, and then we go and buy those luxury apartments. Um, and even the, the use of the word luxury, where bodies um, essentially remain. I mean, when, when the KLCC was being built, um, my colleague, Ajil, who was with Naganita since its start, she will tell you about the migrants who tell you about the people who died building the Twin Towers. Um, and there might very well be bodies there, who knows? Because when you have an entire class of people that we don't record their lives, um, who exist as um, labor and not as people, then so much that happens to them becomes invisible. And so all of us, nice, kind, civilized people, um, here in this room, we have, we clearly must have told ourselves some kind of a story to continue to exist in this society that allows that to happen to continue to be friends with all these neighbors and family members who have domestic workers in their homes, domestic workers who never have a day off. Um, and and I, th I feel like that is an important role of art, um, to make it damn uncomfortable for us so that we cannot look away. Um, okay, I have, I have two thoughts. Uh, thanks, Krishina, that's you, you actually helping me helping us to make a case for art. Um, okay, two thoughts. One, uh, when you speak about violence, and when I was talking about return, uh, it is violence also returns. And it may describe an extremely wide circle. And if it misses you in this life, it'll come back uh, later on, for sure, almost as a, a physics of being human. It does return. Um, the other thing, too, is about story. So, um, 
I think really the only thing that has ever changed my life and really, really changed me, so changed me, uh, is a story. Uh, uh, and specifically, um, science fiction, for, in my case, uh, my favorite writer, Ursula Le Guin. Uh, some of the things that I have read in her books uh, have, a, in a way, the story allows, teaches us, um, uh, and allows us to be able to look at what is unbearable. To, to not, not and, I, and I don't mean um, to dismiss it, or to, to lessen it, but to really, sometimes when you look at something so straight on, it is unbearable, the cruelty. Uh, just why be human at all, oh my God. Uh, but if we can somehow make a space uh, in ourselves, and it's almost like a muscle that has to be trained, and maybe art can help train that muscle, uh, um, is that slavery is part of the story of Malaysia. And if we can find a way just to accept it, like, it, this is our story, it's not happening out there. Uh, and, you know, just like, like in Sao Yi's work, fold that narrative in. Uh, somehow I think that is a space for hope, for action. Yeah. Um. I'd like to take this opportunity now maybe to see if any one of you have got a question. Yeah? Um, I'm going to leave one of the mics and then we're going to share. Okay. Uh, thank you, Shannon, for everything you shared, uh, especially that video about um, called As If Home. So I'm definitely going to look that up. It was really interesting. And it's one way, I think, you said even the migrant worker was kind of weirded out thinking what's this lady doing, right? The like, oh, the artist. <laughs> no. Uh, the, the worker was like, this is work. No, so that's the thing, you know, even he's like, he, um, anyway, so yeah, so I'm definitely going to check that out. Uh, but um, Katrina, um, the, the picture you painted is um, really painful, but it's true. It's very consistent with um, everything that I've personally watched in documentaries that go inside, sometimes undercover, go inside the detention centers in Malaysia. Uh, but there is a huge disconnect. So I don't know, that, that's definitely not broadcast on uh, mainstream media. Not many people know about what's happening. But as so-called legal people, I think all of us are so-called legal in this room, what's the most effective action we can take to uh, do something about this because it's very uh, it's a very painful thing to live with i mean once you know it it's, you can't like ignore it right thanks what did you have to say oh, i thought the question was what could legal people do about illegal people <laughs> No, but Katrina, you did talk about wanting to come back to this, right? Um, yeah, no, and actually, I, I didn't, I have these slides just because, and I'll run through them really quickly, but oh, one thing is just understanding that if you can't look away, that's already pretty significant. Because a lot of people do look away, even after you know. I mean, that's that constant justification that we do, right? And I think one of the most important things that everybody needs to do is to do the work on yourself. Um, I need to do the work on myself. Just because I do human rights work doesn't mean I don't have internalized sexist ideas and prejudicial beliefs and racist ideas. And it, it's, you cannot escape it. And just getting really honest with the fact that all of us here hold terrible ideas um, and we, we have to unpack them and get really real about them is one of the most important things you have to do. Um, so that's one, do the work on yourself. Um, two, I think that there is the, of course, the immediate interpersonal things that you have in your interactions with, with migrants, with domestic workers. If you have a domestic worker, understand that she has rights that now extend you're not doing her any favors by just treating her as a family member she's a worker in your home 
She's a worker, which means she has rights. There are boundaries. She has a choice that you take her to the shopping center on a weekend is not you doing her a favor. If she wants to go with you, cool. But let her make decisions for what leisure and pleasure uh, is for her, you know? It's, it's always astounding to me. People say, yeah, but then you go and you see them. Like She's taking care of the kids and she's eating where you want to eat. It's like, it's the worst because we don't think that they um, um, have the choice to make these decisions. We are so astounded when they want to have relationships. Why? <laughs> they, are, they, are, they are people. Why is it odd that they may fall in love and that they want to have sex? It's it's them as they're human beings. So these are things that you have to just accept. And when I say do the work, do the work on yourself, do the work in your immediate circle. Thirdly, I think that, um, think about the power that you have. I think every one of us has power in many kinds of ways. Um, and you think about your power and think about the platforms that you can access, the privilege that you hold, and ask yourself, how do I put that to work? How do I put my privilege to work? How do I use the space that I have, the voice that I have, the tools that I have um, to, to highlight, to make known what is going on, but also to make known what should be? Do the work to allow yourself to imagine a different reality. Because we can't just get stuck on what is terrible. We have to try and imagine alternate ways of being. And that can be really hard. Because when you're so used to seeing things as they are, to try and imagine a different reality um, is to challenge beliefs that you have about how the world should be. Um, and finally, I think just on a very um, concrete kind of advocacy way, we, you have to hold the people in power. Um, you have to hold their feet to the fire. Nobody gets an out on this. When you say that you belong to a country and you you belong to a democratic process, that means not just voting, but continuously holding people to, um, to account. Um, but on the note of voting, please go and register to vote. <laughs> That's a, there's a campaign going on now, I just have to say that. Um, but yeah, think about your power, think about yourself, and yourself and how that can be um, put to, to change. Thanks. Any other questions? Uh, could you maybe start with your name? Thank you. Uh, what exactly is it about Malaysia that, that, that creates this problem? I mean, is it something to do with the fact that Malaysia is sort of neither developed nor a developing country like the countries that you mentioned, or is it just something more than that? I think let's all interrogate what that word developed also means. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's like when we say developed, um, like I, I, I I take issue with it because I think it, it hides um, a, a lot that happens in so-called developed worlds. Uh, it also, when we say developed, what are we developing towards? Um, what kind of model? So I, 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 I know what you mean, but I also just want to, it's a reminder to myself also to never fall in, in, into prey when using that word. But what is it about Malaysia? And I, I don't know. I think that's something that when I say do the work on ourselves, let, let's ask why that's kind of what I've been trying to ask, right? How do we get to this point um, that this is normal for us? Um, is it that we are, we all profit from this reality. Um, let's, let's not pretend that we don't. Slavery is profitable, not just for um, the people who are the employers and the people in power. Slavery is profitable for us. I mean, we, it allows us to live in in this country with these roads and these buildings um, to buy food that's kind of affordable. Um, and it, it's putting ourselves in that is, um, I think, allows us to like, kind of create this culture to happen. Um, I think that there's very poor political will, but both on the side of Malaysians, but also the state. Many people don't know, and I think when I started doing this in 2007, 2008, many people weren't talking about refugees. People didn't know we had refugees in Malaysia. And so sometimes when you don't know, then you, you can't act, right? You don't know, you can't heal something that you don't understand. Um, and so that's why we've got a huge responsibility to, to make that known. Um, I think we've gotten very used to very racist realities in Malaysia. 
um, among ourselves, um, very classist um, realities among ourselves. We're a very patriarchal country. We're very, our ideas about gender, um, are all, all of this is poisonous. And there is, when, you, when we understand that, then it's not surprising that um, we see it manifest to migrants and refugees. The way we treat indigenous people in Malaysia um, is consistent with how we treat migrants and refugees. The way we treat the poor in Malaysia is consistent with how we treat migrants and refugees. So I think that's the other thing we have to understand, right? That these are not isolated issues. Once you start talking about human rights, um, you've got to understand that these frameworks apply to everyone. Um, I think as a country, we also don't talk a lot about our rights. Uh, we are not comfortable with the idea of rights. And, and when, you are not, when you don't believe that you, as a people, you have dignity and you have rights, um, or we don't understand that they're universal, then it makes it okay to do it to others. But the thing that we have to understand is that as soon as you start to compromise on other people's rights, you compromise on your own. Rights, human rights, the, the entire foundation cracks. Um, and, and we see that, right, in Malaysia. So we've allowed this to happen to the indigenous community. We allow it to happen to migrants, then it's us, really. I mean, now it's a survival of who, who is the most um, economically powerful gets to survive well in this country. And it just keeps going on. So there's lots of different points. And maybe, I don't know, what do you guys think? Why, how do we get to this point where this is normal and OK? No, I, I, I want to like, go back to maybe asking Sharon about this and, and the sort of ways of um, seeing the other right um in terms of uh, the juxtaposition of the me you and the pandatang the migrant and so just before the talk started we were talking about how these sort of realities as much as they are quite violent um has reached a point at which our shock level has almost been desensitized so let's talk about this idea of this notion of sensitivity perhaps and whether or not this is something perhaps um, as a practitioner, as a person who makes art, if you feel that there is a different way of um, creating space for a different type or a different sense of sensibility, um, or sorry, sensitivity, where you allow people to maybe look um, at something differently. Um. as opposed to maybe the objective fact. Okay, one thing I do know is that awareness is not the same as sensitivity. So these are two different things. That's one thing I know. Um, I think it comes back to the body. It comes back to the body because that the body is what we share. It's undeniable. You cannot, if you, so therefore, if you deny someone else's body, it, that also means uh, denying your own. It's a kind of violence against your own body. Must, must be, it feels. Um, So, okay, like, but, okay, so I wonder, uh, mm. I, I think, I mean, unless we don't see the other body, I think, you know, there's a, migrants are everywhere in Malaysia, but there's a way of unseeing. I think we, we see functions, you know, we, we see a house that's cleaned, we see, buildings coming up but our focus is like the body somehow has disappeared and I, I don't know how I, I think it's the but we uh, it's the utilitarian value of bodies but we also see this uh, I think a little bit more more and more in ourselves we start to think of ourselves as productivity units lately uh, Facebook for example sees you as nothing but an eyeball uh, that's all you are, you are not a person. And therefore, it's starting, I, I feel, in a very long way, come back to us. Uh, it's related 
to how we see our own selves and work. Um, yeah, this actually I want I, I that there's a there's a photograph I saw last week on Instagram, somebody taking pictures on along Pataling Street. Um, and when you talk about pleasure and leisure and how uh, we don't connect these ideas with migrant bodies. I think that that is something that is really you can latch on to, that's something that the mind can latch on to. Because, okay, so this, this photograph uh, from the street photographer was uh, of a street massage. And it wasn't like, an, it wasn't like a social enterpri uh, enterprise thing. It was, um, I think it was a homeless person had set up this massage and the mat was cardboard. Uh, and uh, it was a massage service for other homeless people by homeless people on Pataling Street. And so that when I saw that picture, it was like a, it, it, it yeah, why not? Or, or pleasure, leisure, uh, comfort, creature comforts, because we're all creatures. I, and I think, um, but the question was why we don't see that. Right? The question was how we, how it's uh, stripped, how it's stripped. It's a process, right? Bureaucracy, um, capitalism. Ca I mean, capitalism. Thank you. We, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody let's, has to say that word. <laughs> let, let's name the, that other vulgar C word. Um, but I, I, I think also just, I, what's always astounded me in Malaysia is, we, our migrant roots are so recent. For so many of us, my grandparents came from India. My parents are first generation Malaysian. It's, it's so recent. But that's the other thing, we don't talk really about those stories. You know, we don't, we don't talk about, there's just like they were here, and then there were some British, and then they left, <laughs> and there were some nice buildings, which is the only heritage sites that we will um, applaud in Malaysia. Um, I'm looking at you, Penang. Um, <laughs> But I, I think that's, there's so much that we don't talk about and that we disconnect from our own realities and, and then we are just doomed to replicate. And I, when I said earlier about the intimacy of violence I, and the violence in our homes, I, I just can't believe, I cannot accept that none of us are changed by, in some ways, from having such close encounters to the dehumanization of another person. Um, we know that historical trauma exists, right, in, in communities that have suffered various forms of, um, of, of, of dehumanization, so slave communities, um, indigenous communities that have been exploited. The, it's, you know, scientifically, you can see how trauma resides both just, not in just cultural memory, but in the body. Um, and I wonder from the other side of it, like, how does it not change us as a people? Um, to normalize a practice over time and then to be really silent about the things that I'm sure many of our grandparents went through. Uh, I mean, there's the colonialism is very, very recent and we don't talk about, about that history in Malaysia. And when we do, it's in like places like the Majestic where it's so, uh, it's, 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 some, it's like this thing that is luxurious when actually colonialism was so violent um, and, and somehow, just within 50 years, we've become okay with it. And so maybe it isn't that surprising that we are all kind of comfortable with this because we've denied our own history. Um, we've denied what happened to our families. We've denied what happened to our mothers and our fathers and our grandparents. Um, those of us here who are the elite, we've denied the complicity of um, of our ancestors in the exploitation of others. Um, and so that cognitive dissonance, right? That's, that's what we need to get at, the dissonance from our own history and the behaviors that we seem to replicate. Um, and also the things that we applaud. Um, there's an exhibition that's on, on that end. When I was looking at it, it had to do with these videos about skin color and about you know, fair, and, fair and lovely or these ideas of, of white skin. Being, being privileged. And I just remember looking at it thinking, yes, it's so real. Um, and, and our ideas about whiteness, about what bodies matter, 
what kind of bodies um, can cross boundaries with ease and what shouldn't. All of that plays into this, right? So when I said earlier, do the work on ourselves, do the work on that too. Migration issues is not just the subsect, it's everything. It has to do with economics, it has to do with our understanding about who is worth, um, worthwhile, worthy to exist among us. Yeah, I don't know. My name is Tamara and I'm from Latin America. Uh, when I hear you talking, I just think the, the, the his, well, we have very short memories everywhere in the world. And uh, I hear you speaking about Malaysia and I think this is a story of every single country in the world. Uh, if uh, you have seen the exhibition, I think on that side, there, is, uh, there, there are some uh, paintings of uh, migrant workers in China in I don't know which century. So um, I think two, two, uh, several key words you've mentioned for me. One is that we, um, we, we, f we forget. Yeah? We are not aware of, uh, of time, of history. Uh, we are not aware. We, we are sensitive, so I, I see that, or I listen to this story and I feel touched by it, and um, that's it. Uh, it it's like uh, I, I keep a distance somehow with that, maybe to protect myself, I don't know, uh, but I just leave it there. Uh, number two, human rights. It's part of our daily life. And so I don't think uh, when I, when I s listen to your work, I say, it's fantastic, but human rights ha has to do with our everyday practice. Uh, number three, I think in, mo in, more, in one country is more and than the others. Like for example, you ask, what can we do on a daily basis? Well, I think voluntary work is something we can do on our daily basis and we don't do it anymore. We have, I think, in the world in general, uh, to say things in general is very dangerous, all. but uh, I think uh, we devote very little time to community work. Uh, and we can do, we, for sure, everybody knows, if not a migrant or a migration center, then maybe a, a impaired hearing people or many people who are subject to. Um, well, they, they don't live the right world or they don't have all the rights they should have. And those things are really close to us and the very little time uh, or money or effort that we can devote to that, uh, it would mean a lot to the, to the world. It's like when you don't throw a paper in the street and you say, well, it's just this little paper. Well, that counts a lot. It counts for me when I say hello to someone I don't even know in an elevator. If they don't say hello back to me, that's their problem. Uh, I say it's my education, I was brought up like that. I want my children, my grandchildren, to be tender to people, to, you know, uh, to have sure. just a, a word for someone. So I think it's just those very little things uh, that artists also make us see. I, uh, there are some pictures, uh, a photograph, very impressive about uh, the, some um, domestic workers yeah. uh, that could put um, yep. a grenade. Would you, would you like to maybe summarize that really interesting point about amnesia? Well, that's it what I wanted oh, to say, okay. basically. No, but it's, <laughs> that, it was, that, it was uh, lovely because I think um, the fact that the privilege that we all have today is also hopefully after this talk to be able to look at the works again in this exhibition with maybe the, a, a sort of new way of looking or new pair of eyes. Um, yeah, but going to maybe amnesia, taking from, from that, the idea of forgetting um, and, and forgetting that like that our relationship or our history of migration was so close and often sort of thinking of stories of migration as the, the story of the other or migrants as, you know, the other, right? Um, they are perhaps within art as well, the, the criticism of that. We um, practitioners or artists do works that are about the other and works that perhaps 
that kind of show that lineage of, of the story that we come from, this long story of migration that we are also part of, the other. Um, so would you maybe like to um, kind of give your thoughts about how, where Pocket sees, or maybe even your larger sort of like um, artistic practice tend to look into um, in terms of reconciling the, the process of othering and the process of embedding yourself within that story as well? Um, I think there's a very famous paper about this uh, by Gayatri Spivak, Can the Subaltern Speak? Uh, it's a difficult paper to read. I have not read it in full. Uh, but this question, uh, <laughs> this question in my practice is 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 constantly there. Uh, actually, when I I mean, when I when I went around this show, uh, one of the things, one of the thoughts that occurred to me was, okay, uh, which there there are two different sort of categories of work that I, that I put the works into. So which works uh, were about the other, uh, than, as in migrants, with a capital M, uh, and which works sort of made me feel or made me think that the human story is one long story of migration. So that was, that was one way that I looked at this show. And pocket sees, for me, I think, I think, I think it falls in the second category. Do you want to maybe exp um, expand further on how your work or, or your process um, that is perhaps invisible to the, to the rest of us here who only see the final work. Like, what is that process in ensuring that you don't just um, make work about the other? Uh, I think it, that question comes down to asking, it's not so much what is the function of art, because then you start to think about utilitarian things again. What, what can art do to change the world? What can art do for migrants or, or, and refugees? What, what can art do in the face of the stories that uh, Katrina has told us today? Like, really ask yourself that. Uh, it doesn't do anything in the sense of saving anyone. Uh, I, yeah, I think my work changed when I when I accepted this, um, or came to this conclusion. I mean, it may not be the a right conclusion, but it's where I've landed at the moment. Um, so from there, once I landed there sort of thinking about what it cannot do, then I started, it's from there, I went on to, okay, what, what does art do? What can it do? Uh, that's the process of my thought, the shape of it, how it came from somewhere and then sort of jumps off to somewhere else. Uh, Yeah, where does it go? I mean, where does it, wh yeah, where, where does it go? That's what I keep, what I always think about when I think about what I make. Where did it come from? Uh, either the story or the resources to make this thing. Uh, the, where, where does everything that I have come from? Uh, because if I can be clear about that or like l look at that, then then uh, it gives me a place to depart from. Where can it go? So if you don't know where something comes from, you don't know where you're going to go, uh, if that makes sense. So what do you think in terms of pocket seas, where is it going? Or rather not 
it as in the work. Um, where are you today in relation to the point that you created that work? Um, in terms of your own um, in investigation or inquiry into home and the language and the distance that we spoke about. Um, because the I, on the one hand, there is the, the risk of um, always locating the other. And you did locate the other in terms of these sort of um, dictionaries in a second hand bookstore. Um, how do you like take that um, into your own space, into your own politics, into your own bodies? Okay, I, I think um, a big part of this work uh, is actually what wo was working with what's already there. So it, ca it came from place, really being in a place where you are, which is surrounded, for me, Penang was surrounded by the sea and, and I had never lived in a place like that. Uh, and the dictionaries were already there. So they, they were already in the secondhand bookstores. Um, I think maybe that gives some kind of answer about what what we can do, I suppose. Does that is that I mean approaching it in a really like crap like way from the side? Uh, what is there? Like if you pay attention to what is there, don't don't look further. Uh, there's going to be something, and you from from that thing just around you. Uh, can go pretty far, I feel. We have a tendency of wanting to think about how does this particular action impact that change? And it's once more coming back to, this is kind of how we train, you know, what is your immediate output? What is the impact that you want? But actually, we, we, when I said earlier that we want to think about these, this radical imagination, right? You must, it's almost like a muscle that you have to train. And it, it must be really rooted in a, a very real belief in, in the worth and dignity of people. Um, and if you root yourself in that, and if you imagine that a, another kind of reality is possible, then I think that all these actions that you take right now, um, they build towards something, and that change may not happen in your lifetime, but the actions that you do now are absolutely imperative for that greater change to happen. Um, in this kind of work that we do, I mean, what is the best case scenario with the cases that we take? They're so awful. And best case scenario, people get some money, they get to go home. That's it. I mean, that's pretty dire. But also that's one less person who is in that terrible state. Um, we take, we, we talk to people, we talk to politicians, we advocate, and l lifetimes pass, things barely move. But if you don't take these steps right now, then they're never going to move. Um, and so the, I, I think just pushing back on our need to see immediacy, but really rooting ourselves in, in the belief of what is it that we are um, fighting for and defending, is really important for everyone, not just people who call themselves human rights activists. Um, you need to believe in the, the purpose that you have right now and how that builds to a change that you may not live to see. But you doing something now matters, it absolutely does. Uh, okay, thanks, Katrina. About the flexing of that muscle, the, uh, it requires imagination. And actually, like, it's not all pain and effort, it's joy. Like if you've ever worked out in a gym, I do Muay Thai, okay? Um, what it feels like to build a muscle, to flex that muscle, is pure joy, really. So, um, not pure joy, but <laughs> there's a lot of joy. <laughs> Let's just say there are different kinds of muscles in the body and some are a lot more enjoyable to flex <laughs> than others. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but no, but joy, actually, I'm really glad that you, you brought that up because I think the, the activists that I know who are the most incredible are people who really love life. And when I say you like, defend dignity in life, you, you, you got to love life, you got to love people, you got to love, like, the, it, it, it cannot just be about the pain. 
um, because that act of working towards something better must be rooted in our ideas of, 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 um, of love, of kindness, of humanity. And I, I, let's always push back on those who say those are flighty thoughts. They're not, you know, they, they, they are what make us people, uh, make us human. Um, and that, you know, the space to laugh, the space to come together is really, really important. And maybe one of the things that we do is for migrants, for refugees, what are the spaces we can create with the privileges that we have for them to come together, to do what they want, to seek um, joy. Um, I wanted to say also that some of the things that I really hope that we all try and figure out how to do is, and, and thank you for your point about people getting involved in community, is to support the work by refugee women, you know, to support the work by migrant organizations. Um, if you're a teacher, if you're a doctor, if you're somebody who's good at finance or administrative work, if you're a writer, I mean, everybody has something that you can do. And there are ways in which you can involve yourself. Um, everyone is connected to your own social networks. Um, of friends, family members, Muay Thai, gym people. Um, it's getting people connected, right, to this. And so think about your own circle and think about how you can create those spaces, um, not to just talk about the pain, but also about, about the joy. Yeah, I think um, sort of departing, or no, rather not departing, but kind of like soaking in the gravity of the stories that you've shared. Let's end this talk with that note on, 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 on levity, right? With a bit of lightness. So I think thanks a lot to Sharon and thanks again, Katrina. Um, and thank you all of you guys for joining and asking your questions. I always like to end uh, talk with more questions and this one definitely left me with more questions. So I hope you guys would um, stay a bit longer and take a look at the exhibition if you haven't already but if you have, um, second looks always uh, nice and feel free to talk to any of us. Yeah? Oh yes, don't forget, um, let me just remind everyone very quickly there are books, t-shirts, CDs and candles that are made at the shelter. All of this proceeds, and also the um, zine and um, Sharon's Pandatang Arrivals publication, all of the proceeds will go to Tanaganita. Yeah. Thank Just you. Just a quick yeah. thing on, on the album. Um, the album is called Silence Voices. It was put out over a decade ago, but um, there are songs that are written by migrants and by some of the Tanaganita staff. And um, one particular song that I really like is called Nirmala. I don't know how many of you remember, but there's a story of Nirmala Bonat, a domestic worker who suffered the most horrific violence in Malaysia. Um, it was a very famous case just because of the, the scale of the violence. Um, and the song Nirmala is by the Indonesian ma migrant workers from Flores, where Nirmala is from. And they wrote the song Nirmala in kind of in honor of her, and that's one of the songs on the album. Um, so just do have a look at it, and, um, and, and we talk about people creating their own stories and their own words, and I think music is a, another great platform for that. Thank you all so much. <laughs> <laughs>